Hey folks, how's it going? Dr. Spin. Galactic Time Reviews and General Musical Meanderings. And you know I forgot this shirt on. I mean business. And I do. Because this is the mid-year top 12. This is my favorite top 12 albums that I've listened to this year so far. I've been through a meticulous process of deciding. I think this is a really good set. Before we go on, if you've never seen my best of videos before, you got to keep in mind that if you're looking for like the hippest, coolest new music from 2024, you're probably going to be a little bit disappointed because my approach is to include any album from any time in the, in the history of music. It could be an album from 1966. It could be an album from this year. As long as it's new to me this year, then that's what I'm looking for. And the idea here, of course, is for people that are out there saying that there's, there's no new good music. I can't find anything new that I really like. I'm going to do the work for you because a lot of this music has been pulled off of like last year's best of and and some highly um, critically acclaimed albums from this last year. The idea is to give you some albums that have already been kind of vetted and if you're looking for something new to check out, maybe this will give you some inspiration to go ahead. And finally, these aren't in any kind of rank order. We save that level of complexity for the end. These are just an alphabetical order from beginning to end. So I'm going to start off with Adventures of Jet Muscle. I tried to resist this this year because Bob Goblin and Adventurers of Jet, these are kind of alter egos to each other, have gotten a lot of attention for me for the past two or three years, especially for a band whose main period of activity was 1995 to 2000. And there was a lot of really great music they went up against this year, not the least of which was that Jay Robbins Basilisk album. I really loved that disc and I thought that might be the one that night knock this one off but infectious melodies especially all of the the synthesizer keyboard lines they use to wind through the music great song craft amazing musicianship seems to win them out every time okay next up i've got avalanche kaito's talita kun <laughs> Now, if I want to put Adventures of Jet on top because of their songwriting, I can't look at Avalanche Kaito in exactly the same way because they're not a pop band. They're not really about songwriting. This is more about uh, catharsis and texture and noise. It's essentially a noise rock band, but a very unique one because it's an intercultural noise rock band. You got two guys from Belgium who play the cl classic idea of you know guitar, drums, noisy sheets of sound. But their lead singer is as a as a West African musician who has a background in griot uh, traditions. So he brings a whole different element, and it ends up being this sort of really great like ethno battles uh, that even if there's aspects of their songwriting that might be questionable certainly the concept and the execution of that concept that they have in this gives them the win on me okay next up i got black pumas chronicles of a diamond more than I went through phases with this album because at first I really, really loved it, and then there was a phase in the middle where I kind of, kind of questioned what, if my first impression was correct. But it kept coming back, and it kept winning me over, and it won over the people around me—my children, my wife, my kids. Everybody loves this album. So many great songs on it, and kind of an uplifting overall message on this album is a nice digression from a lot of the darker stuff that we've been exposed to in life and in music recently. Next up is Death's Dynamic Shroud, Transcendent Spot. Death Dynamic Shroud pulls on a wide variety of electronic music styles. They have their roots kind of in a vaporwave, but they pull in like industrial and pop synth pop and minimalist music to create something that's really pretty unique and very, very convincing. It's a loose concept album about a, a, a artificial intelligence that becomes sentient, and certainly the music itself kind of bears that up. It has a sense of almost being like an AI-generated album, even though it's way, way more creative than, than that. And it's powerfully produced in a way that allows its really beautiful, melodic, textural sides to cohabitate with its more abrasive aspects. Okay, next up is Jay Dilla's Donuts. Play me. Play me. Buy me. When instrumental hip hop is done well, I really, really love it. But also, it's very easy to kind of dial in a, a, an instrumental hip hop album. J. 
Jay Dillis certainly doesn't do that here. It's wonderfully creative and, and seamless in the way that it puts together its various elements. I'm always fascinated by the way that really good DJs are able to do that. And it's a playful, fun listen. It's got little minute and a half to three minute tracks that segue all the way through. It has a sense of just almost being its own DJ set. And the fact, of course, that it was basically made on Jay Dilla's deathbed, it really is a testament to his creativity and his, his fortitude to be able to make something so creative and so kind of positive feeling in light of his own demise. Okay, next up I got Floating Points, Elena. This album's got a very interesting history with me. I had it in my 2023 Tier 1, it got bumped out. I put it in 2023's Tier 5, again it, it got bumped out, but in both of those cases it was bumped out by really high octane folks like Frank Sinatra and Gentle Giant. And I never really got a chance to, to really dig into this album and, and understand it for what it is because Floating Points of Music is the kind of thing that you have to listen to multiple times. It, it's deep and it's thoughtful, and especially this album, I think, has a lot of subtleties to it that you just can't get by one or two listens. Really glad I came back and listened to it again and kind of gave it another shot. This is Floating Point's debut album, but knowing what he, where he was going to be going in the future with, with Crush, and especially with the, the Promises album, he was starting to cross boundaries really early in here, and this is one that crosses boundaries between jazz and, and, and electronica in a really super compelling way, and kind of in a way, again, that only Floating Points, I think, could do because of his own unique background. And his sense of curiosity and intellect is really what makes this album, I feel like, bubble through with an enthusiasm that you probably couldn't get just by hearing it on its most superficial aspects. Next up, I got Peter Gabriel's I.O., The Dark Side Mix. Now, if you look at the breadth of Peter Gabriel's catalog, this album has some flaws that are a little bit problematic. But the argument that the worst of Peter Gabriel's work is better than most, most people's best work totally holds true here. There's a confidence to Peter Gabriel, even at this phase in his career, this late phase in his career, that shines through on this music. It's dynamic. It's uh, powerful, it's gripping. It's characteristically Peter Gabriel music, but almost, almost to a fault. Kind of reminds me in a way of, you know, Phil Collins' last gasp on his career was when he created the Tarzan soundtrack. And you kind of laugh at that if you want to, but there are some really great Phil Collins moments on that soundtrack. This kind of feels like that for him. It's not a soundtrack the same way, but it kind of feels like a good summary of some of his best work. Next, I got Mo Troper, Troper Sings Bride. Under normal circumstances, I would really balk at putting a tribute album on, on the top 12. But this is a unique one, right? This isn't just Mo Tripper going out and finding John Bryan's most visible work for the sake of you know selling his albums on somebody else's music. Instead, he found these kind of obscure, unfinished demo tapes that John Bryan had been circulating and got kind of um, permission to, to create an album based on those demo tapes. So this kind of shines a little bit of a light on parts of John Bryan's catalog that maybe we've never heard before and John Bryan would probably maybe never get to. He's not really invested in producing music like this as much as he used to be. So Mo Trooper does a really great job of being deferential to John Bryan's style as it appeared on his classic album, 2000 album, uh, Meaningless. This is meant to sort of be the sequel to that album and it does a really pretty respectable job of doing that and in doing so creates a really great album. Again, John Bryan's worst work is better than most people's best work and Mo Troper does an awesome job of showing how true that statement is. Okay, next up I got Nickel Creek's Celebrants. I think of all the albums on this particular list, this one in some ways is the most ambitious and also the most successful. Although this has kind of a reserved style as it's kind of coming from a bluegrass background, it's also extremely musical, very virtuosic, and I've, I've jokingly called this prog bluegrass before, and I'm not going to back down from that statement because I really feel like it captures the kind of ambitious um, scope that a lot of progressive music has. It's based very loosely in concept on uh, Brian Wilson's smile, but it's not trying to sound like that as much as it's just looking at the full album as a, a vehicle for expression. And there are some magical, magical moments on this album. Okay, next up we got Jeff Rosenstock's Hell Mode. I got a 
very divergent stuff what we're talking about with Nickel Creek. A Jeff Rosenstock's album is a post-punk, punk pop album, kind of reminiscent of Green Day or maybe early Weezer, especially the Pinkerton era. And, and if you're a follower of Anthony Fantano, this is his album of the year from last year, and it's one of the reasons why I went ahead and put it in rotation. I think it actually lives up to that hype. Because despite being, in, in a way, kind of apocalypse therapy, its whole point is to kind of rail against the, the, the powers that seem to be aligned against us again from, from external sources. It does it with, almost, with a carefree and almost fun attitude that makes it feel really, really relevant. Okay, next up I got Sleepy Time Gorilla Museums of the Last we Human Being. We must know more. We must know more. We must know more. We must know the, the last human being. Is a and yes, I know, this is probably the weirdest one of the bunch. If you're going to describe it in one sentence or less, this is like Tom Waits meets Mr. Bungle. And even that, in a way, kind of constrains it because the, the kind of instruments and, and the scope of this album is very, very broad. And it comes off like this like post-apocalyptic cabaret music, like a dramatic troupe of mad scientists going around talking about the end of the world to the people who've, who've been experiencing it. And its avant-garde nature really requires multiple listens. Music this weird doesn't reveal itself easily, but it's very, very expressive and very musically coherent throughout its, its runtime. Well worth it. And finally I got Van Halen's A Different Kind of Truth. Now, this album's kind of been a thorn in my side in a way because whenever I got into it at the beginning of this year, I was ready to listen to it and let it go and let other things kind of take its place. But I can't help it. This is probably the last time that we'll get music from Eddie Van Halen. And despite it, again, not being Van Halen's finest work, it certainly I don't think it's their worst. It does a pretty respectable job of, of capturing the lightning in the bottle energy that Van Halen had in the 70s. Something about David Lee Roth and Eddie Van Halen, when they get together, there's a sort of Thing, chemistry that happens that pushes Eddie to do really some amazing things. And in recent years, as I've become a fan of Wolfgang, Wolfgang Van Halen, I really appreciate his place in this album as the bass player, but also kind of one of the, the inspirations for the album, inspiring his father to, to complete these old songs and going through and finding old songs that as source material to pull on. Uh, his, his dedication and his interest in making this album work is is... I think crucial to its success and part of its, the interesting part of its story, its context. The real shame about this album is becoming increasingly difficult to find. David Lee Roth wasn't super complete with his performances on this album. It's had kind of blocked reprints of this album and blocked on a lot of streaming services. So if you can get a hold of a copy of it or see it over on YouTube, I'm telling you, it's a great, great disc. If you're a Van Halen fan, you'd really be doing yourself a disservice if you didn't stop and check it out. And that's it, my mid-year top 12. So these 12 albums are going to be showing up again at the end of the year in December as part of my year and top 20 to get special dispensation on that list and if you think this list is kind of malarkey you think you could probably do better you can join up on my patreon below and be part of my viewers choice bracket i'm doing their list as an accompanying post in the next week or so and you can be involved in the in the fall uh brackets to choose the the best albums for next fall and the best albums for 2024 so if you want to keep up with all that please like and subscribe and then share it out with your friends also follow me over on spotify believe me there's tracks from all these songs in my dr spins radio list and again sign up on my patreon if you want to be involved in making the choices that will shape the end of the year's uh, top 20 for the viewers choice and until you see you next time i'll catch you on the flip side Mano be ima desimo Mano be ima desimo